break it up in the back. Don't want to hold us up. Good morning and welcome to St. Matthew's on a warm but beautiful day. Um, just for fun, I looked up this morning, like today is National Wet Day and found a few. Uh, it's National Snake Day, National Corn Fritter Day. I don't think you should combine those two. It's also Personal Chef Day. And probably most importantly, it's National Ice Cream Day. Yay! Although I feel like it. Yeah, if you're still at home, uh, we are having ice cream afterwards, so you can get down here in time. Um, but I, I feel like it's been National Ice Cream Day about six different times so far this year. Um, anyway, uh, sometimes it feels like they're just pulling things out of a hat for each day, but. Uh, most importantly, uh, this is a day that the Lord has made, so let us rejoice and be glad in it. So, Pam, if you'd start us off with a call to worship. Please rise. The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Lord prepare our worship. And we in prayer to receive God's word. The Lord cast the seeds among us. Our opening prayer. Lord God, our mind is full of things that draw us away from you. Sometimes we focus a prayer and a praise your way, but then we wonder, oh, how long for a mind at rest, for a heart at peace. Help us walk beside the still waters. Guide us on the paths of righteousness for your sake. We lift this simple prayer. Amen. All right, our opening hymn is In the Garden. And uh, yeah, when we sing this, we want to uh, realize that it's uh, not between us and anyone on the earth, but it's just between us and God, between us and Jesus, uh, where our true fulfillment and peace uh, is from. <laughs> so here's In the Garden.
Now just take 30 seconds to say hello to someone near you and then have a seat if you would. And kids, come on up. Come on and join me here. Like. So here's what we're going to do today. Do I have any other kids who want to come on up and play with our Legos? Anybody else? All right. All right. Well, listen, here's, uh, here's what we're going to do. You guys can pick, uh, pick up like 10 of these. Go ahead and grab them. You know, you can share. You can grab some too, of course, Ryan. There you go. And Rick. So what I want you to do is in the next uh, minute, I want you to create something. I don't care what it is. And while you're doing that, I'm going to talk to you, and I'm going to see whether or not you can remember what I say while you're building whatever you're building. Because here's what we're talking about today. We're talking about a singularity of thought. We're talking about living an undistracted life and how tough that is. But uh, some people do better with things in their hands. So, for instance, when one of my seminary classes, they put uh, modeling clay on the tables in front of us. And we were talking about eschatology. We were talking about end times while we were making, uh, you know, the famous snake or the uh, infamous bowl that never held anything. You know what I'm talking about? How many of you have made either of those two things? You can, okay, all right. So, uh, and while we were doing that, we realized that I realized it was better than taking notes because I would always scribble down notes, but I would never really absorb them after the fact. So it was just a way to kind of hold the distractions out of our minds, out of our, out of our, our, our place that we're in. And so Legos seem to do that. Uh, and Legos generate all kinds of creativity, and they also generate a lot of pain when you step on them. Amen? Amen. That's why, there's, that's why night lights were invented for Legos that were left on the floor when you had to go in the middle of the night. So... All right, so that's basically what I wanted to talk about today was how much God, think about this, when God created humanity and Adam was the first one there, and when Adam and Eve were together, they had a job to do. Do you all remember that they actually had a job in the garden? Yeah. They were given the tools to care for the land. They were told to take care of the garden. They were supposed to be growing things. We haven't come that far, really. And God created us before the fall. God created us just the way we were in, the God, in God's image. And actually in the scripture, in the Hebrew scripture, it says we in our image. So in the image of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Very simply, it was that God was the creator. And there was a time later on where we needed some help with that. So the creator, green, the symbol of life, and then the blood of Jesus... And then the power of the Holy Spirit, which, oh yeah, we need, a, which, which do you think we need? The smile? Okay, all right, so. And the Holy Spirit, this is the Trinity. I don't know about God seeing us, but all right, well, whatever. All right, so I just said, we'll simple with this. As simple as that, the creator, the one who could redeem us back to the relationship God wanted in the first place, and then the Holy Spirit that's always with us. And I know it's in this order so that God is always first. So what did you create? Let's find out. All right. Anybody share? I love the rock. What is it? Is a rocking, uh, a character. Can you show, hold it up so people can see? And uh, the wheelbarrow. I like that too. So she has a rocking, oh, breakable character. There you go. All right. Uh, tell us what you got here. Um, I have a zoo. A zoo. Oh, man. He created a zoo. We're going to leave these right here so people can see them after church. Tell me about your zoo. Um, there's an elephant cage here. We, and uh -huh. this is like a wheelbarrow where they're working on like a giant 
All right, so there's an elephant cage with an elephant in it and then a wheelbarrow for creating things. And they're working on the next exhibit. He's already expanding and you haven't even come yet. All right. Can people put money here as a donation to your zoo? All right, all right nice. Oh, it's money there too. Okay, all right, all right, all right. Did you create something over here? Cameron Zoo, ooh, look. Now we have another animal. We need more exhibits. You need more exhibits? Well, maybe some of these grown-ups will come and play with the Legos afterwards. <laughs> Just don't step on them. Yes, Rick, what do you have? Not a clue. Not a clue, but it rolls. That's nice. So it's a delivery truck of odd things coming in and out of the zoo. We actually have a theme here. Isn't this awesome? Except for that. Well, weird statues end up getting put all kinds of places. All right, I'm going to pray because we're out of time. Are you guys ready? Let's pray. God, we are grateful that you have trusted us to be creative and to use our mind for the things that would bring joy to us and to others, like a zoo, like uh, caring for this earth, caring for the animals of this earth. Lord, as you continue to work in our life, we just pray that we would take a breath and take a moment, and we would trust that you love us that much. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. We'll just leave it right there. Pastor Stan. By the way, it's good to see you. It's good to be back. It is, yes. I'm going to steal. If each person could get one of these. This is a very, very difficult subject for me. Um, and I'm glad that it, the children have left the room. <laughs> Actually, I want to join them. Um, we're going to see a video. And I know, I, apparently there's a movie out, right? Uh, uh, how many have seen it? Nancy was talking about it, and uh, Pastor Jim was talking about it, so, and others. I, I, I don't know any anything about it, but I have seen short videos on this subject of human trafficking, and uh, I, I want to apologize for showing this, and yet at the same time I want to speak about on the other side of my mouth saying, no, we need to see this. You, you see the tension here? There's a dilemma here, and so I, I am flummoxed. I want you to hold this piece this Lego piece. And I want you to imagine this representing childhood. And so as you're watching the video, we can practice what Pastor Jim was saying if we hold something or deal with something. But I want you to imagine this represents what children should be doing. Are you with me on that? Yeah. This represents childhood. Let's watch the video. I was sold in a brothel to men for sex, over and over again. They treated me like an object, not a person. I was assaulted and abused more times than I can remember. I felt worthless. My heart was broken and I just wanted to die so that the pain would stop. I needed to be rescued, but not just from the brothel, from the trauma pain, the constant tears, and the hopelessness. And through the love of Jesus that the people at AIM showed me, I was. AIM got me out of the brothel and took me to their restoration home. 
social workers, caretakers, and other girls showered me with unconditional love. They were kind and gentle and patient with me, even when it was hard for me to accept their love. I was treated like a princess, and I felt the love of God for the first time. Therapists and counselors helped me to heal. I didn't think it was possible, but I can actually trust people again. I can actually love myself and believe in myself. AIM trained me and gave me a job in their employment center. They supported me through college and helped me pursue my dreams. Without their love and support, I would have had nowhere else to go. I would have ended up back in a brothel, exploited all over again. God used AIM to set me free, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. But there are more girls out there, still trapped in brothels, hoping and praying for someone to set them free, and they need your help. With your support, AIM can rescue them and help them heal, just like they did for me. So I, I know a lot of you are thinking, well, that was pretty tame compared to some of the other things we've seen. And there was one that I really wanted to show, but I couldn't watch it without crying. It is very difficult. Now take a look at this. This represents childhood. This represents what those kids should be playing with and what has been taken away from them, their childhood. Now I want you to look at this, and I want you to go think of this. Imagine with, you, with me, if you will, this represents one person held captive, bondage, and human trafficking. And I want you to think. I have a choice. I have a choice of what I'm going to do. Let us pray. Lord, in the Gospel of Matthew, in the 25th chapter, there's a moment of judgment that takes place between the separation of sheep and goats. Goats go to the left, sheep go to the right. Sheep go to heaven, goats go somewhere else. And then they're asking, Lord, in this parable, what's the difference between the sheep and the goat? And the difference is based on a choice. It is a choice of what we do with our resources. How we respond to a need. For those who are held captive and in bondage to human trafficking, they have no power. But for those of us who are here in this room, we may not feel like we have power, but we do. We have the power on how we're going to make a choice. There are so many great organizations out there that fight human trafficking. And in this month, right now, we are focusing just on one of them. And so, Lord, help us to make that right choice. In Jesus' name. Our scripture this morning is from Matthew 13, 1 through 9 and 18 through 23. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. They sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil, but when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. 
Let anyone with ears listen. 18 through 23. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but ensures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution rises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of, the, of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. God's word for God's people. All right, and today uh, we were so blessed to have Abby here, and she's going to play uh, Naoko Ikeda's uh, Shooting Stars in Summer.
Abbey. That was wonderful. And a great piece of music, by the way. How did you know we needed a song with a little dissonance and a lot of kind of melodic harmony? That was perfect. And uh, Naoko, I'm not familiar with her music, but that was beautiful. That was beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, I have a short video for you. I, want to, I wanted to tell you the story, but I think it's better it be told from the person who lived it himself. So uh, let's go ahead. It's called Keep the Faith. People think we're more divided as a country now than we've been in a long time. I know it can seem that way, but when I was a little kid in 1969, the Vietnam War was tearing the country apart. And they'd shot John F. Kennedy and they'd shot Bobby Kennedy. They'd shot Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. And there was the Manson family and the Zodiac Killer, and it just felt like the whole country had lost its mind. My father had grown up in the Depression, well, his faith in humanity was just at a low ebb. And the two of us that June were driving from L.A. to Oakland in an old 1960 Oldsmobile, and a water pump blew out south of Bakersfield. And so and this was long before cell phones, so we were about, well, we were going to have to hoof it like nine or ten miles into town when this young cowboy pulls up in a flatbed and offers to tow us in. And all my dad had on him for money was this old Chevron gas card, so he kept telling this young fellow, you know, I can't pay you. And the young cowboy's looking at him like, yeah, I wasn't going to charge you. So he rolls us into town, and this is a Sunday, so nothing's open. So he has to go get his mechanic friend to open up his garage, and my dad says, hey, listen, I don't have any money. And the mechanic says, you know, we'll work something out. And then they all realize they don't have the actual parts, so now they got to go roust out the local auto parts store owner, and they bring him down. And my father's like, okay, okay, we need to talk about how this is all going to get settled. Because he just couldn't imagine anybody being this trusting about the money. So the cowboy says, look at it and make it feel better. I got a bunch of watermelons I need to get loaded onto my flatbed, and it's pretty hot work, and if you help me out, I'll pay for the part. So next thing you know, we're all unloading watermelons from inside a rail car, and that's about 140 degrees. And 90 minutes later, we are soaked in sweat, and up rolls the car, just run like a top. And my dad says, I really don't know how to thank you, fellas, and, uh, for this good turn. And we're turning to go, and the mechanic gets this look on his face, and says, whoa, whoa, where do you think you're going? And you could see on my father's face, just all the fear and distrust come to the surface. And he's stiffened like a leopard, and the mechanic says, no, no, no. My wife's going to make us all Sunday dinner, and, and you and the boy can get a shower and a clean shirt, and it'll, it'll make the drive easier for all of us. So we sat down for the dinner of fried chicken from the chicken right over there, and corn on the cob from the corn right over there. Man, I got to tell you, I, I, I'm, we'll never have a meal that good ever again. And my dad didn't say maybe three words the whole drive, but when we got home, I got into bed, and I was just about to turn off a light, and he stops in the doorway, and he says to me, no matter what you see in the movies, or on TV, or you read in the papers, you listen to me. That's how people really are. And about a month later, Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. So, keep the faith. So let me substitute for movie, TV, and newspaper. We got all these social media sites. We got constant bombardment. You can't even go to a restaurant anymore without a TV being blaring and, well, at least 10 of them in different rooms. Yeah. And you got people who are disturbing you all the time. And even to pay a check anymore, you got to pick up a computer and figure out how to work the thing. <laughs> and if you don't know how to do that, someone comes over and says, well, let me help you. Oh, I guess our Wi-Fi is down. So another half an hour goes by where you can't even give them the money and... I remember a day, I was nine years old in 1969. I remember being stuck on the side of the road, helping somebody else and being helped by somebody else. I made a practice of it when I was a young driver to stop and pick people up if they were stranded or get out and change tires for folks. And was warned every time I did it, this is a terrible thing. You know, the world's changing. And I used to think, well, the world might be changing, but I'm not. So my need to help somebody is still there. And if I die on the side of the road because someone's robbed me, at least I did it doing something that I know God wanted me to do. I still try to stop for folks. The world has not changed. The world is still a violent, crazy, and wild place. It always has been. And what we think is terrible today and what we think is possibly could never have happened in the past has happened over and over and over again. 
What shocks many of us is that it's happening closer and closer to our home. That's what bothers us. But we are bombarded every day by what I think is clearly defined as distractions. So I want to go back. Jeff, uh, I can't rewind all the way back to that segment. If you'll take us to the first verse of the scripture in Matthew 13. I want you to look at this because we skip over this and we go to the parable of the seeds too quickly. That same day, Jesus went out of the house. He went out of the house. Usually he did this early in the morning. Many of the passages in Matthew, especially in Mark, tell us that he got up and he went out to pray, to spend time away. And what did he do when he went out of that house? Tell me. He sat beside the sea. (laughs) He actually sat down and had a moment to think without anybody around him. And if you've ever had the blessing of staying overnight near the ocean and just walking out and sitting on the beach before everybody else gets there, you know what that's like. It's a magical place to just feel the movement. Now the sea is probably the Sea of Galilee, and it still has waves. It still has movement in there. There's no tides, but there's plenty of water shifting around. And so he's just sitting there by the sea. And when the crowds start to come, Jesus is trying to get a perspective now on how he's going to teach them. We often think of him going up the hill, but he gets in a boat and he pushes off to the edge of the shore. And and there's where he teaches from. Why? So he can see them. He sees the people he's teaching. He's able to take in the shoreline and everybody who's standing on the side of the hill because basically everything runs to the center and the Sea of Galilee. And this days it was called the Sea of Tiberias. But it's the same body of ocean. And there's this, you know, it's a sea because you can't see the other side. The, the horizon, the shape of the earth keeps you from the other shore. So Jesus pulls off so he gets some perspective. And then he teaches an agrarian farmer's parable. There was this Somebody was going to be scattering seed. And this is where we get confused. Are we the seed scatterer or is it God? Who is it that's sending the seed out? And what is that seed after all? So Jesus goes through the whole thing. He goes through it twice, by the way. And then he explains it starting in verse 18. So if you jump back to the sermon then, please. So there's this idea of Jesus trying to get undistracted. Everywhere he went, people were clamoring to be healed. They wanted to have another lesson. They wanted to have somebody touch them. They wanted to have somebody heal them. Parents were bringing children nonstop to try to get kids blessed. Just like this idea that we run to somebody who will put their hand on them and tell them that God is going to keep them and protect them for the rest of their life and that they'll go to heaven if anything is to happen to them. The church has been using, and I will dare say manipulating people into this for years. It used to cost a lot of money to get a baptism. And that money went to the pocket of the priest or the pastor or somebody that Fortunately, we've moved beyond that in terms of this idea of greed. But the thing he warns about in the scripture is one thing. He warns that if the seed is out there and cast, and then all these thorns grow up around it, it is the draw toward wealth. It is the draw toward wealth that chokes out the word of God. That is the most powerful force that comes against it. The evil one that talks about snatching it up off the pathway, because they're There wasn't enough depth in there for it to get further into the ground. That evil one, yes, you can call it the devil. You can can demonetize it. You can talk about people who have this kind of special evil within them. I would say to you, and I believe this is true for most of us today, uh, the evil we face is distraction. It's not that kind of demonic power that comes from someplace else. You have no one to blame except for the stuff that you have in your hand. And... It got so to the point where I have one uh, family member who has a Sabbath away from their cell phone every week now. They try to shut it off. No, no, not silence it, not go to that little button that says focus so that it only vibrates a little bit (laughs) and it only rings a little bit. And God forbid if an emergency happened and your phone was off, nobody would know that it had happened. So, So mine every night at... 10 o'clock, it goes to this mode uh, called Leave Me Alone. Um, There's another name for it in here, but 
So if you call me and you need me, I want you to call me because I am available to you 24 hours a day, but you'll have to call three times in a row and then it will wake my phone up and it'll wake me up. By the way, that's a little trick you might not know. If you're not even in my contacts and you call three times repeatedly, it'll come through. This is all just distraction for most of us, most of the time. We were down in Mexico with our family and fortunately, most of us forgot where our cell phone was. The day that we felt free to be together with our children and our grandchildren and to actually play with them in the water and to be with them in a way that we don't normally get a chance to do so was the day that people threw their cell phone in somebody's bag uh, by the pool someplace and nobody could remember where it was. And it was, a, it was just like camp. When it got to Wednesday, the middle of the week, well, we got there on a Wednesday, so that would have been a Sunday. That's when people started to kind of not worry so much about that. And by you know, Monday and Tuesday, it was like, okay, well, it's here somewhere, and somebody's cell phone died. And then my, my daughter-in-law even left it in the room as she was heading toward a plane to fly back to the United States. And it was like, oh, yeah, I forgot my cell phone someplace. That's a little too, going this is going too far. But the point is, distraction is a part of our life, and it continues to be, I think, our most dangerous spiritual practice, is this idea that if we're not busy, if we're not informed, we somehow are behind. If we don't know what's going on in the world, we somehow are not being faithful because we're not caring about other people. Well, there's only a limit to how much you can care for, and there's only so much you can do about distractions. I'm reading a book right now by Bob Golf. I, I recommend this author to you almost point blank. Now, I'm, I'm a third of the way through the book, so I don't even know how it ends, but I can tell you how it begins. It begins with a very simple message. Distraction, for somebody like Bob, is a, is a real thing. In each of his books, and the first one you might read is called Love Does, and he, he spent a lot of time on this. And Bob's got all these connections with different people. He's a pastor who became a psychologist who went back to being a pastor, who became a, this, who's a business entrepreneur, who went back and now he's writing books and he does all these ministries around the world. Uh, his, his opening example was uh, he was in a minefield uh, near the borders of Iraq and Iran where he, they were building a school and he saw a sign about a minefield and so he walked uh, that direction knowing he'd stop before he got to the minefield. Then he realized he had actually wandered into the minefield. And he got this brilliant idea to pick up a rock and throw it over there to see whether or not there were mines out there. And as he released the rock, he realized, oh, I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> you can't throw a rock far enough to not have a mine go off that might trigger other mines to kill you. But he said as it hit the ground, thump, you know, like, oh, thank you, God. I'm an idiot and you just <laughs> saved me from whatever it was going to be. The other he used was from the Oaks. It's a Christian uh, conference center that's uh, in Lake Hughes. Very uh, familiar to us because we had sent our youth group there um, on a regular basis, and I've done several retreats there. And it's Lake Hughes is that little community going up the back roads heading toward the Antelope Valley. And uh, the Oaks is a, is a beautiful conference center. It was put together by Jack Hayford and a bunch of other people from different churches make a long story short, they were making a promotional video and he was going to take balloons and climb up the water tower at the Oaks, which they had just purchased this land and they were trying to drum up some business and support. And, and he's standing at the bottom of the water tower trying to figure out how to get on the ladder and go through the various uh, rings to get himself to the very top so he could release these balloons and they're filming this whole thing. And while he's concentrating on the water tower and the rings around there, a rattlesnake's went right through his legs and curled up right in front of him while he's doing this thing here. And he said, well, that's what encouraged me to write the book, Distracted, because he lives this life. And this is the other thing he does. He puts his telephone number, his personal cell phone number in the back of every book. So people can call him. Anybody who wants to call him can call him 24 hours a day for the rest of his life. And they probably have to ring three times, but he never puts his... <laughs> He never puts it on silent. He never turns it off. And I, that's just insanity. But he's really a good writer. And this is a great book. Just to think about distractions. 
We keep thinking we need to be more spiritual. I think we just need to be more focused. Because taking a deep breath, you know, there's mindfulness now. There's a whole other generation being raised with this idea of being present. Being present with yourself and being present with other people. It's kind of like that grandmother in your life, maybe, that you had that actually paid attention to you and listened to your stories. <laughs> Mine would listen to me sing, oh, oh, awful, awful, awful. But when I was a little kid, she would just say, oh, Jimmy, and she'd put her hands through my curly hair and say, I wish I had your hair, which, come to think of it, that's a weird thing to say to a child, you know, like, <laughs> give me your hair. But she would encourage me. She would say, let's sing another one. She wasn't musical. She didn't care. For me, it was music. For my brother who was playing the guitar, she just paid attention to each one of us. All six of us got her undivided attention. You with me? Do you have a person in your life that has done this for you? Do you have somebody that loves you that much that they're paying attention to you? This is what God wants to do every day. And God does this, pays attention to us listens to our prayers. The Lord of the universe is actually focused on one and all at the same time. I don't know how God does this. It doesn't really matter. God knows every single child that we're representing as we give to AIM. I was privileged to be on the call this past week um, and was listening to, it's your cousins, right? And they were talking about their ministry in Cambodia and other countries nearby. And as we were, as I was hearing the stories that he was sharing and she was sharing, I realized that with all that energy, the only thing I kept thinking was, how do they possibly get up every morning with so many people they're dealing with, 300 plus staff members. And these, most of the staff members that they have are girls, women who have been trafficked and who have now been rescued. So they're now working the streets and the areas that people need the most help. And I kept thinking, I was, a, I was wondering their energy that was just so you know, evident that they loved God. They loved Jesus so much that this is the work that they're doing. And I, I kind of figured out by the end of that Zoom call that it was because they had a singular focus. They knew what they were going to do with their life. And maybe they've been CEO and you know, program director before and went back to that. Or they've worked in this. How long have they been in the in AIM? Early 2000s. So 20 plus years then. So this is, this is heartbreaking work, but when you know what your mission is, you can do it. You can actually live with joy in the most horrific of circumstances if you know why it is that you're there. You can be a caretaker 24 hours a day if you know what your purpose is and when you know that you need to be able to separate the roles out. Caregiving is the hardest work that anybody could do these days. Why? Because you can't be distracted. You have to pay attention to the person that has the need. But then you also need to know exactly when it's time to, to stop for that period of time and to focus on something else. To get out of the house and go sit by the beach and let somebody else take care of whoever's in the house. That's what Jesus was probably thinking when he went out. He snuck out that door. Can you imagine the God that we know that became flesh sneaking out the door like a teenager getting home too late at night? He's like creaking. Oh, oh. Thank God that they didn't really have doors in those days. And they were hung by leather, so there were no hinges to creak. And he just, kind of like, I hope the disciples do not wake up. And he goes right down to the beach. All right, let me try to be more helpful. <laughs> Distraction can capture your calendar and hijack your happiness. So in the fourth chapter, Bob spends some time here talking about the difference between happiness and joy. And I don't want to spend a lot of time here, but happiness is a feeling and joy is a state of being. Happiness is an emotion. It's something that emotes in us and it's fleeting and it's short-lived. Now we can define it to be something more than that, but in the Bible, happiness is rarely used, but joy is used all the time. Oh, let's go back to the parables again. What is it that we are capturing when we have the soil that's good soil and that where God can grow something. 
And by the way, I'll just clear up these definitions for a second. In this parable, there's three ways you can take this, but in the Greek, it's really that God is the sower and the seed is the word of God and the soil is us. So the good soil is just that we're ready to receive God plummeting into us some essence of the word. And when we're so busy walking the path of life, running from here to there, the seed might fall on us, but it doesn't have any place to grow deep because the path has already been completely patted down. Path, I think the word itself is this place that gets trampled over and over and over again. And you might know that the Romans had uh, these chariots that had wheels that were precisely measured at exact distance. And that's what built the roads that were in the Roman Empire that started with the Persians and the Greeks used them as well. And we were so smart that when we decided to build railroad tracks, we would take the measurement from Roman chariots, wheels, and we laid every track in this United States the exact same width as the Roman wheel. Did you know that? We're just so sometimes not creative. And why is it? Because creative people are not constantly distracted. Creative people, like Legos, have a focus while they can absorb other things. By the way, that story is true. You can go back and read about the Roman chariots. And every single path was laid out. Well, it was so hardly run into the ground, compacted soil to the point where nothing could grow there. And that's why today you can still walk across these Roman roads. We're going to be going to Greece next year, as many of you know. And one of the places we're going to visit is where they used to roll the ships over from the Ionian to the Aegean Sea, or the other way around, from the Aegean to the Ionian Sea. And they used logs where the the slaves would take the logs, the ship would be pushed across with slaves and also with animals, and they would pull these ships up on a set of logs, and then they would take the one that just got cleared, and they would run to the front, and they'd put a log there, and then they would push the ship over these logs as they, same set of logs, and they did that for a thousand years. We go there today, that same path is there, it's one mile long, and it runs from one sea to the other, and that's what took so long. So the sailors would all get off the boat, so there wasn't so much weight, and they would go into town, and that's how it became this amazing place of culture and language and all kinds of stuff that men liked to do when they got a little money and a little time. So the two best buildings in the town were the bar and the brothel across the street, and then they had a church that started there, and the, the, the Christians were starting to draw in people, sailors and other travelers from around the world, and they would supply way too much wine and way too much bread and women as well. There was this sort of system going on. So when Paul visited there and saw what was happening in the church, that's why you know in Corinthians, he said, whoa, hang on just a minute here. This is not about pleasure. The joy I'm talking about is when you are connected to God, not when you're connected to other people, especially in over-imbibing yourself in all of these different ways. Well, we'll go and we'll visit that actual path that is still not growing anything 2,000 years later. Distractedness, focus, movement in the same place. I wish Martha was with us. By the way, Martha's home and recovering from uh, her hip surgery, and she sends her love. I'm hoping you were able to tune in this morning, Martha, but this is for pilots. If you're anybody here a pilot? Okay, Martha, we really needed you this morning. Uh, so this is what a pilot goes through in their mind every time they take off or they land an aircraft. This is the acronym that they have to remember, GUMPS. First of all, do you have enough gas to land the plane? And if for some reason you can't get the plane on the ground, do you have enough gas to full power go around and make a second approach? So you check your gas levels, make sure that the tanks are in the right place. And you always switch it to the tank that has the most gas so you can go around, but also if you crash it, it doesn't explode, but it spills out onto the ground. Undercarriage, make sure you have your landing gear down, big thing. And when you take off, make sure you've lifted your landing gear up so that you can clear the mountain that you're about to hit. Mixture, there is a mixture in an aircraft between oxygen and fuel. You have to make sure that that's set to the richest setting so that you have as much power as possible. The same is true for the propellers, especially those that uh, can, uh, 
they can articulate so it gives you most power on takeoff and landing or your set and cruise so that you get the best mileage. And make sure your seatbelt is tight and fastened across your waist. How many times do we have to hear that on an airplane? When our grandchildren got on the airplane to fly down to Mexico, there were some of them going like, it wasn't a car seat, you know, where you strap on the 17 point harness. So they're like, there's just a little seatbelt here and there's a button on it. This is not something that they see very often. So, so this is what happens now. Pilots do this in their brain every single time they take off and when they land. Why? Because there are lots of pilots who forget to put down the landing gear or to set the mixture. Most of the pilot error on takeoff and landing, according to Bob uh, in his book, uh, happens because they did not go through this checklist in their brain. It's going through it again and again and again. Now, how many of you get distracted when you're driving? Would you raise your hands? I know you're out there because I just rode 1,500 miles across California and I met people just like you, <laughs> just like us. What I love about riding on a bike is there is no distraction. You are absolutely 100% focused on who's in front of you, who's next to you, who's behind you. It may seem like that's a lot to take in, but your entire focus is to stay alive. <laughs> and to make sure that nobody is going to interfere with your space and get into your space. It's freeing in a way, because there's nothing else to, you don't answer a phone, you don't have a, you don't have a big gulp sitting next to you in the car, you, you're not playing with your screen, you're not playing with your phone, you're not listening to music or news or a podcast, you're just absolutely 100% focused on on what's happening around you. And you feel temperature changes one degree, one way or another instantly. You smell everything that's out there. Riding through Gilroy, you're, you're reminded of why vampires don't live in Gilroy. So. <laughs> and that garlic ice cream, still good stuff. Still good stuff. So the soil that God is looking for are for those that can hear and who are paying attention. That's it. God wants to plant in us who are paying attention to what God's doing in our life and around us in the world. It's not magic. It's a discipline to just be calm enough, still enough, to turn off. Thank the Lord we still have off buttons on all of this stuff. Have you noticed the older you get, the quieter you want the restaurant and the louder you want the TV? Anybody with me? Yeah. And if the, if the dialogue would be as loud as the explosion, that would be really helpful too, right? So many of us, have, uh, we use closed captioning now and with, without, oh yeah. That was God's gift to video and television and broadcast was words that we could actually read at the bottom. Because we start to mature into a place to know that we cannot handle 75 things going on at the same time. And we often think that like women can do this better than men. Research has shown that women are not better at multitasking than men are. They, uh, they, that's what they say. These are the neurologists. I don't know. I'm not going to defend one move or another on this. But I think what they have discovered is that women have a better um, capacity for we're tying things together. They can take 15 different elements and somehow see the weave between all of that. And so there's this sort of beautiful, it's just like Mary Magdalene who could take herself and project into this why she would break the oil and the, and the nard at the feet of Jesus and, and anoint him before his death using her own hair to wipe the feet off, if that was Mary Magdalene and not another doesn't matter, but she's doing this because she sensed that Jesus and listened to him when he spoke about the end of his own life. Instead of saying, no, you can't do that. She accepted the fact that he was heading toward death and she somehow was able to love and pour herself out on this. And um, this was a way for her to love Jesus, to love the man that she loved, but could never have maybe in a sense as some a life partner. So 
This is how it works, friends. I'm going to end with this. To just, in fact, if you close your eyes with me for just a moment. To know that God loves us so much that God wants to fill the silence that we offer. That he gave his only son for us in this dramatic and horrible way so we could have peace and receive this gift of love. To not be distracted by any sound that is around us, but just to simply hear our own breathing and the beating of our own heart. If you feel like it, just put your hand right there on your chest and feel your own heart. To know that God loves us so much that this heart is going to beat a couple billion times in our life. We don't have to take in any other sound or any other moment or movement. Just to be with our Lord now. We pray, God, through the power of your Holy Spirit, that we can live undistractedly. We pray this in Jesus' name. And God's people say, Amen. Amen. Next week on part two, we'll talk about what to do with this undistracted life and why the seed casting becomes our job eventually. Amen and amen. Would you come and lead us in prayer, Ryan? As I was listening to uh, Pastor Stan earlier and uh, some of what Pastor Jim said, um, I was reminded of a, a quote I heard, um, I don't think he was the one who originally the, the quote, but uh, one of my uh, heroes of the faith, a guy named uh, Shane Claiborne, who's a social activist, uh, Christian activist in a lot of ways, but he said that, you know, so often we pray, you know, when we're faced with various situations, you know, God, why aren't you doing something about this? And then God's response is, well, I was going to ask you the, the same thing. <laughs> so basically, uh, as we go to a time of prayer, uh, I would ask that we think about not only bringing our, our requests to God, but how can we uh, be the answers to those prayers. So will you pray with me? God, we thank you uh, for the, the many blessings you, you've given us. We thank you uh, for the things you want to do in our lives and through our lives. And God, we thank you that we are, are part of... Uh, a larger community of other churches in our conference, and we pray for uh, Big Pine Community and Pioneer Memorial uh, United Methodist Churches, and ask that uh, you would bless their services, that you would inspire them to go out and, and make a difference uh, for you in this world. And Lord, we have a few uh, specific requests for Donna uh, having hip surgery, for David uh, having surgery for uh, a, a blocked kidney, that you would guide uh, surgeons, that you would guide doctors, that you would give them wisdom, and that uh, they would have a, a speedy recovery and a, a pain-free recovery as well. And Lord, there are many on our hearts, uh, many family members, many friends, uh, many in our lives who um, are hurting in one way or another, whether it's physically, whether it's emotionally, whether it's relationally, and we ask that you uh, bring healing and comfort and peace to their lives, that you would show us how we can bring uh, healing and comfort and peace to their lives. And God, there are many uh, in our lives and our families and friends and circles who are, are suffering from cancer. And God, we ask that you would, uh, again, be a healer, a, a comforter, a peacemaker in their lives. And that you would help us to do, do the same. 
And Lord, for those uh, in mourning, uh, those uh, mourning the, the lives or the loss of, of family members, of friends, that again you would be a comfort and help us to be a comfort to them as well. And God, there's much going on in our world, there's much going on in our lives, uh, so many distractions. And uh, we thank you for the, the prayer that your son taught us to help us focus on what's most important. And we pray that together now, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we listen to uh, Kevin's offertory and as the uh, ushers pass the plates, I just want you to consider the the many blessings that uh, God has given you, whether those are financial, whether those are your time and talents, um, or your prayers or your service, and that you consider how you can give back uh, as a, a response to the blessings you've received. Lord God, you bless us so abundantly, and we offer back to you a small amount of that, that uh, it might go forth, that you would multiply it as the, the seeds that are sown into the good soil are, are multiplied uh, 30, 60, and 100 fold, that our gifts back to you would be multiplied and would do your work in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Him is Guardian Song, so uh, I think most of you have probably heard this song before. I don't know. I've been getting mixed reviews on oh, this. Really? It was actually written by John Denver, but it actually has some Christian under and overtones. But it is about growing. It's about planting and growing. So I was going to help lead it here. So yeah, yeah. Here we go. <laughs> Inch by inch, row by row, gonna make this garden grow. All it takes is a rake and a hoe and a piece of fertile ground. Inch by inch, row by row, someone bless these seeds I sow. Someone warm them from below. This is the 
part we hate. Pulling weeds and picking stones. Man is made for dreams and bones. Feel the need to grow my own. Cause the time is close at hand. Grateful rain, sun and rain. Find my way in nature's chain. Tune my body and my brain to the music from the land. Plant in rows and straight and long, temper them with prayer and song. Mother Earth will make you strong if you give her love and care. Oh, grow watch in hunger leap from his perch in yonder tree. In my garden I'm as free as the feathered thief up there. Last one. Inch by inch, row by row, gonna make this garden grow. All it takes is a rake and a hoe and a piece of fertile ground. Inch by inch, row by row, someone bless these seeds I sow. Someone warm them from below till the rain comes tumbling down. Receive the benediction. Oh God, we do pray that you would help us be organized in our thoughts, inch and by inch and in row and by row, and that we would just be calm enough to see, Lord, how you are developing the things in our lives and to be open to your seed, the word deep in our hearts, to pause with you, to grow with you, and then to flourish and serve. We pray this, God, for us and for our church and for this community in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey. Hey. Hey, welcome you? back. Good. Wow, this kind of looks like Scotty D's bedroom back about 15 years ago. Every once in a while, a ministry message, a sermon, a piano presentation from uh, Abby, and uh, the songs picked all come together to give like an unbelievable message, right? Today was one of those days. I don't know if you guys are feeling it with me, but for sure. All right, so much going on in life of the church, but one thing I want to say that's not up here Script orders. We um, Stephanie is working at the script table today, and she doesn't know what do you want from her, please? Because then she'll order stuff, and then somebody will come. You know what I'd really like? So please come see Stephanie today and tell her what you'd like to see on the script table, and she will order appropriately. All right, what's going on in the life of the church? <gasps> Study series on Tuesdays. No meeting on the 11th. That's already passed. Moving on. All right, we're meeting this Tuesday. All right, what else do we have? Oh, the 22nd, we're assembling lunches for the homeless. The last time to bring the food 20th? is the 20th. End of day Thursday. And end of day Thursday. Okay, perfect. And celebrating life, love, and connection. Conejo Connect, they are uh, the, they're meeting for Campfire and S'mores at 7 p.m., right? Oh, look, so much exciting things. 6 p.m.? All right, my paper's on. Come early. Get, come early so you don't miss the s'mores. All right. Uh, family Vacation Bible School. This is the big thing. We can really use some attendance and assistance. So who do we see for that? Be Pastor Christie online, online or the office. You know where to reach out if you want to help or attend. That's an awesome thing. Altar flowers are provided by Kent Detweiler. <gasps> Flowers for pretty girls. Thank you, Mr. Detweiler. And our fellowship today is provided by Tim and Janice? No. Who's it provided by? <laughs> Linda Domes. This is wrong. I don't want to say that. Shh. Don't tell Debbie. All right, Linda Domes. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> Happy birthday, Cheryl Qualls, Aurora Smith, Daniel Palm, Carrie Lamb, and Robin Grant, Allie, happy birthday, Allie, and Nora Shapiro. Can we sing? Shirt on today that says 
practice aloha. St. Matthew's Church family, welcome home. Thank you.